This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome to a new video from Jockler 66, Hour of the Truth, with another reading of the History of the Inquisition from Philip, from Lim, uh, Philip van Limborch, the Dutchman who wrote this book in 1692, shortly after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes that again set on fire the persecution of the Huguenots and other Protestants in France. He wrote this book in 1692, dedicated it to Queen Mary II, who was married to Prince of Orange, who, after the glorious revolution in England, took the Protestant throne and reigned for some time Protestant England at that time. History that is written, among others, in this book, but also other books, like Romanism and the Reformation like the history of Protestantism from James Aitken Wiley, like many other books that people do not know even though there are modern writers, like for example a book that I'm reading for the moment and that is, has, has impressed me very much up to now, Code Word Babylon by P.D. Stewart. Part 1, Danger in the Vatican. You also have Part 2, The Antichrist is a Woman Alive and Well. I hope that I will ever get to that. All these books can help us understand history. And why is understanding history important? Simply because when we do not know history, we do not understand the present and we cannot make any predictions to, for the future. Now we have a book that tells us exactly what in history happened. And that is the wonderful word of God the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. That book tells us everything we need to know. But that book is of course not easy to understand for everybody. And you must be 
a believer in Jesus Christ and be led by the Holy Spirit to understand the Bible very well. But even then, you don't understand everything. There is not one man in this world today who understands the Bible completely. Let me assure you that. So, when we have the Bible and we read through the different prophecies of the Bible, we will understand from our standpoint today, in the year 2017, that what was written 2000 years ago in the prophecies is actually just history recorded before it actually happened. That's what prophecy is, because God knows the end from the beginning, and he gave inspiration to some men to write it down. Like, for example, John the Revelator, who wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. The whole book of Revelation is the history of the Church of Jesus Christ after he went up to heaven. We have to understand that. It is nothing else but the history of the Church of Christ. And, of course, it also points to the apostate. To the falling away that was warned of in Thessalonians, I think. Second Thessalonians, if I'm not mistaken. There must come a falling away first. And then that man of sin will be revealed, that son of perdition, the Antichrist, that little horn of Daniel's prophecy. That falling away came about in the 4th century when Emperor Constantine was taking Christianity at that time that he couldn't conquer and declared it to be the state religion of the pagan Roman Empire and then mixed all the pagan rites and the pagan gods with the saints and other names of Christianity. And whoever followed that from the original apostolic church was following that apostasy. And out of that apostasy grew the orthodox, as they called them the first, the orthodox Catholic, Roman Catholic Church that we have today. And the Antichrist was revealed from out that church. Like the Bible says, because he sits in the temple of God, making himself God. Well, the temple of God is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And the Antichrist came out of the church, out of the body of Christ in that time. And he is like P.D. Stewart says in his book, the Antichrist is a woman. A woman is a church in the Bible, as it is explained in a few places that you understand. And alive and well today. The Antichrist is alive and well since more than 1500 years today, 2017. And the Antichrist is that office of the papacy that persecuted the remnant of the real Church of Christ, the remnant, those people who didn't fall into apostasy from the beginning. And that church found a refuge for 1260 years during the hardest persecution that church had ever uh, experienced in the reign of Antichrist. And some say that was the time between 538 and 1798, that is official um, Seventh-day Adventist teaching that we have today, but there are also indications that that was the time period between 606 and 1866, as I explained already in the video before. And when I continue reading now, I will repeat the last two paragraphs that we come into the right mindset again to understand that and then we'll continue reading the book the history of the inquisition a history that is hidden from us in the school books that is hidden from us in the universities that is hidden from us in the uh, 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 in the in the uh, official libraries where we can go to and that uh, book that is hidden from us of course in the pulpits because there is no preacher there is no priest and there is no pastor in this world whoever will teach you this truth of the Inquisition. First of all, because they don't want you to know that truth. And second of all, because they would 
lose everything that they had if they all started talking about that. The whole world wandered after the beast, remember? And the priests and the pastors of today are part of that. The priests and the pastors of today are the scribes and the Pharisees of 2000 years ago. Nothing's changed. But to come back to the history <coughs> that we were reading in the book of Limborch, I'm going to continue reading now where I left off last time, just going back uh, a little bit more than this uh, paragraph. Last time I read the yellow highlighted part here. I'm going to read the whole paragraph now again without any comment because you heard my comment. You saw the notes that I took here and that you can see right now in the picture of this video. And you know that all the links, I put them in the upload of that last video that you can find when you go to the playlist, History of the Inquisition. And there you will see that. See all the links and can do the research for yourself. And to get us in the right mood and for continu continuity sakes, I will repeat the last paragraph starting with under Mauritius. Mauritius is a Roman emperor. And under Mauritius, John Bishop of Constantinople, in a council held at that city, Constantinople, styled himself ecumenical bishop by the consent, by, means by the agreement of the quote-unquote fathers there assembled in that council. And the emperor himself ordered Gregory, that is the bishop of Rome at that time, the pope, to acknowledge him in that character. Now Gregory absolutely refused it and replied that the power of binding and losing was delivered to Peter and his successors and not to the bishops of Constantinople, admonishing him to take care that he did not provoke the anger of God against himself by raising tumults in his church. This Pope was the first who styled himself, and we are talking about Gregory, Servus Servorum Di, Servant of the Servants of God, and had such an abhorrence of the title of Universal Bishop, and we have understood from the last reading that Universal Bishop means the same as Pontifex Maximus, that he said, I confidentially affirm that whosoever calls himself universal priest is the forerunner of Antichrist by thus proudly exalting himself above others. So Pope Gregory knew that when he calls himself Antichrist, he would be the forerunner of Antichrist. Of he would be the Antichrist. Let's call a spade a spade here. And he didn't want to call himself that. But, however modest Gregory was in refusing and condemning this arrogant title, Boniface III thought better on the matter, and after great struggles prevailed with Phocus, the emperor, the Roman emperor of that time, who murdered Mauritius, the emperor, to declare that the see of the blessed apostle Peter, which is the head of all churches, should be so called and accounted by all, and the bishop of it ecumenical or universal bishop, Pontifex Maximus. The Church of Constantinople had claimed this precedence and dignity, and was sometimes favoured herein by the emperors, who declared that the first see ought to be in that place which was the head of the empire. The Roman pontiffs, on the other hand, affirmed that Rome, of which Constantinople was but a colony, ought to be esteemed the head of the empire, because the Greeks themselves, in their writing, style the emperor Roman emperor, and the inhabitants of Constantinople are called Romans, and not Greeks. Not to mention that Peter, the prince of the apostles, gave the key of the kingdom of heaven to his successors, the popes of Rome. I will not go into a explanation of Peter 
not being the first pope, but Simon Peter, Simon Magus, which we can read, uh, who we can read of in the book of Acts. I will not go into that anymore because I did that already extensively, and I think that you must have understood that by now. So take that into consideration when you read, of course, what the different um, popes say here, that I made my comments on that already. Peter, the prince of the apostles, gave the keys of the kingdom of heaven to his successors, the popes of Rome. On this foundation was the superiority of the Church of Rome to that of all other churches built. And Phocas, the emperor, who was guilty of all villainies, was one of the fittest persons that could be found to gratify, to gratify Boniface in his request. Boniface also called a council at Rome. You know, there was that council at Constantinople, now he called a council at Rome where this supremacy, being Pontifex Maximus, was confirmed, and by whom it was decreed that bishops should be chosen by the clergy and people, approved by the prince of the city, and ratified by the Pope with these words, Volumus and Juvemas. For this is our will and command, this means. To reward focus for the grant over the primacy, uh, of the primacy, he approved the murder of Mauritius and very honorably received his image which he sent to Rome. And having thus wickedly possessed themselves of this unrighteous power, the popes as wickedly used it soon brought almost the whole Christian world into subjection to them and became the persecutors general of the Church of God, proceedings from one usurpation to another till all at last they brought uh, uh, till all, uh, till at last they brought emperors kings and princes into subjection, forcing them to ratify their unrighteous decrees and to punish in the severest manner all that should presume to oppose and contradict them, till <clears throat> she became drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. A very important last sentence that we've just read, right? Problem with this book is that these sentences are so long. So just repeat the last part. All that should presume to oppose and contradict them, till she became, she, the Church of Rome, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Mystery Babylon from Revelation chapter 17 and 18 is no one else but the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. Now the Inquisition, the author continues, is the masterpiece of their policy and cruelty. And such an invention for the suppression of religion and truth, liberty and knowledge, innocence and virtue, as could proceed from no other wisdom but that which is earthly, sensual and devilish. And as the history of it, which I now present my reader within his own language, gives the most perfect account of the laws and practices of this accursed tribunal, I shall not enter into the detail of popish persecutions, especially as we have a full account of those practiced amongst ourselves in Fox, referring to Acts and Monuments, better known as Fox's Book of Martyrs, and other writers who have done justice to this subject. I shall only add a few things relating to the two other general councils as they are uh, styled by ecclesiastical historians. Under Heraclius, the successor of Phocas, great disturbances were raised upon account of what they called the heresy of the monotheolites, i.e. those who held there were no two wills, the divine and human, in Christ, but only one single will of operation. The emperor himself was of this opinion, being persuaded into it by Pyrrhus, 
Patriarch of Constantinople and Cyrus, Bishop of Alexandria. And though he afterwards seems to have changed his mind in this point, yet in order to promote peace, he put forth an edict forbidding disputes or quarrels on either side, <coughs> on either side of the question. Constance, his grandson, was of the same sentiment, and at the instigation of Paul, Bishop of Constantinople, grievously persecuted those who would not agree with him. Martin, Pope of Rome, sent his legates to the Emperor and Patriarch to forsake their errors and embrace the truth. But His Holiness was but little regarded, and after his legates were imprisoned and whipped, they were sent into banishment. This greatly enraged Martin, who convened a synod at Rome of 150 bishops who decreed that whosoever should, quote, not confess two wills and two operations united, the divine and the human in one and the same Christ, should be anathema, unquote, and that Paul, bishop of Constantinople, should be condemned and deposed. The emperor highly resented this conduct and sent Olympus Hexarch into Italy to propagate the monothelite doctrine, and either to kill Martin or send him prisoner to Constantinople. Olympius not being able to execute either design, Theodorus was sent in his room, meaning in his stead, who apprehended the Pope, put him in chains and got him conveyed to the Emperor, who after ignominiously ignon <laughs> I'm sorry, if this is really a hard word. It's not that old English, but I'm not that very good with it. <laughs> Try to read this part of the sentence again. Olympius, not being able to execute either design, Theodorus was sent in his room, means in his estate, in his place, who apprehended the Pope, but him in chains and got, put him in chains and got him conveyed to the Emperor, who after Egyenunot ignominiously treating him, banished him to Pontus, where he died in great misery and want. The bishops of Constance's party were greatly assistant to him in this work of persecution and showed more rage against their fellow uh, against their fellow Christians than they did against the very barbarians themselves. Yeah. Uh, it's like what they say about the Germans. Eh? If they are being told the right story, they persecute their neighbor much more than their enemy themselves. I think it was uh, Napoleon who said that. Constantine, the eldest son of Constance, <coughs> cut off his two younger brothers' nose, uh, uh, his, you, uh, his two younger brothers' uh, noses that they might not share the empire with him, but whoever happened to be more orthodox than his predecessors. And by the persuasion of Agatha, Pope of Rome, convened the Sixth General Council at Constantinople, in which were present 289 bishops. The fathers of this holy synod complimented the emperor with being another David, raised up by Christ, their God, a man after his own heart who had not given sheep to his eye, nor slumber to his eyelids, till he had gathered them together to find out the perfect rule of faith. After this, they condemned the heresy of one will in Christ, and declared that they glorified two natural wills and operations, indivisibly, inconvertibly, without confusion and inseparately, in the same Lord Jesus Christ, our true God, i.e. the divine operation and the human operation. So that now the orthodox faith, meaning the Catholic faith, in reference to Christ was this, that he had two natures, the divine and human, that he, these two natures were united without confusion into one single person, and that in this one single person there were two distinct wills and operations, the human, the human, the human and divine. Thus, at last, 681 years after Christ, was the Orthodox faith 
relating to his deity, humanity, nature and wills decided and settled by this synod, who after having pronounced anathemas against the living and the dead, ordered the burning of heretical books and deprived several bishops of their sees, procured an edict from the emperor commanding all to receive their confession of faith and denouncing not only eternal but corporal punishments to all recusants, meaning if they were bishops or clergymen or monks, they were to be banished. Again, a very long sentence. I have to go back a little bit to the beginning because it says here, Thus, at last, 681 years after Christ, the Orthodox faith was relating to, this, to his deity. It takes... <clears throat> you have to understand that in the right context, dear listener. The right context is that the church, which is so-called the true church, what they call themselves, yeah, being an apostolic succession since the Apostle Peter, it took them almost 700 years to actually put in words what they believed in. It was the, ortho uh, the orthodox faith was settled what we've just read, after 700 years. How long, how much time did the apostles need to understand their faith? How long did the people who were founding the very first churches, based on the apostles' visits, Paul, Peter and the others, how long did they need to know what they believed in? Also 700 years? No. This was 681 years after Christ only because they made compromises and they had to compromise their own understandings with the understandings of the Bible and even try, of uh, no, not even trying, but putting their own understanding and their own dogmas above the word of God. A struggle that took time for about 650 years. If laymen or any rank and figure, they were to forfeit their estates and lose their honors. If of the common people, they were to be expelled the royal city. These, their definitive sentences, <clears throat> were concluded with the usual exclamation of God save the emperor, long live the orthodox emperor, down with the heretics. Cursed be Eutychus, Macarius, etc. The Trinity hath deposed them. The next controversy of importance was relating to the worship of images. Now, I think it's getting interesting. The next controversy of importance was relating to the worship of images. What was the controversy that we were speaking about before? That was, who was Jesus Christ? Was he man? Was he God? Was he part man? Was he part God? That was the first orthodox question, the Catholic question they had to settle. And they settled that within, wow, 700 years. But now arose a next controversy. And that was relating to the worship of images. Now, even before we go into this, I do not even understand how that can be a controversy within the real body of Christ, because the Lord says so righteously in his word, in the King James Bible, he says in Exodus, I don't know why doesn't that work here, <laughs> try to open this, he says when he brings up the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, yeah? <clears throat> in Exodus chapter 20, he says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that, in the, that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. 
Now God was very clear to the Israelites, who again and again and again fell into apostasy. And God told them in the later coming book Deuteronomy what would happen to them if they fall into apostasy. And as God told the Israelites there in the Old Testament, he tells us in the New Testament exactly the same thing, because the Israelites of the Old Testament are no different than the Israelites from the, uh, the, Israelites from the New Testament. Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christians. We are all the same. The Israelites of the Old Testament are the Christians, the real, true Christians of today. And as the Israelites of the Old Testament had fallen into apostasy, so also the Christians of the modern times have fallen into apostasy. That's what the whole book of Revelation is all about. Jesus Christ is telling all the seven churches, I love you, but you did this, and but you did that. Read the account of the first two books in Revelation for yourself, and you will see that. He finds fault in all of them. What's fault? Falling away. But now we are dealing with images <coughs> and the history of images within the Roman Catholic Church where here we have just read very clear what God says about images. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in their water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. Why is God a jealous God? What does that mean jealousy? Is that covetousness? No. Covetousness is meaning that I want something that is not mine, but jealous, as God is, is being jealous of something that has been taken away from him, meaning the worship. When you bow down to anything that you make from yourself, any likeness that is in heaven above, on the earth beneath, on the waters under the earth, and you bow down yourself to them, you take away the worship that is belonging to God to these idols and then you make God jealous because that worship belongs to him he made you he created you he's the potter and we are the clay that's why God is a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me why do I hate him when I make myself an idol, well, because that if I love him, I do not make myself an idol, but I listen to his words. So there is either love or hate. And when I hate my when I hate my God, I make images. And if I don't hate him, I don't make them, because then I listen to his commandments. And he is giving me the commandment here. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Point. Full stop. If I do not do that, I do not show my love for the Lord, I show my hatred for the Lord. And that's why the Lord saith, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, of them that make themselves images. But I will show mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So it is very clear, if you keep his commandments, he loves you. And why do you keep his commandments? Because you love him. Because you are grateful for the life that he has given you. But let's continue in the book. The next controversy of importance was relating to the worship of images. The respect due to the memories of the apostles and martyrs of the Christian church was gradually carried into great superstition and at length degenerated into downright idolatry. Not only churches were dedicated to them, but their images placed in them and religious adoration paid to them. Platina tells us that amongst many other ceremonies introduced by Pope Sixtus III in the 5th century, he persuaded Valentinian, the younger emperor of the West, to beautify and adorn the churches and to place upon the altar of St. Peter a 
golden image of our Savior, enriched with jewels. In the next century, the images of the saints were brought in, and religious worship paid to them. Now, I cannot help but make a comment about the images of the saints that were brought in, meaning brought into the church, that we have to understand that we are talking about the Roman Catholic Church, and that we have to understand that the images of the saints that were brought into the church were the images of the pagan gods that were re-baptized with names of the saints of the Bible. Whereby, of course, we have to understand that if you are in biblical terms a saint, you are a living person. And when you are a saint in the Roman Catholic sense, then you are a dead person. The Roman Catholic Church has not have, does not have, nor ever had, nor ever will it have a living saint, because it is the Church of the Dead. Is it is the synagogue of Satan. In the next century, the images of the saints were brought in, and religious worship paid to them, meaning bowing down to the images. What did God say on that? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Right? Now this appears from a letter of Pope Gregory to the Bishop of Marseille, who broke in pieces certain images because they had been superstitiously adored. Now Pope Gregory tells him, quote, I command you that through a pious zeal you would not suffer that which is made with hands to be adored, but I blame you for breaking the images in pieces. For it is one thing to adore a picture, and another to learn by the history of the picture what is to be adored. And elsewhere he declares, so that's the end of the quote here, and elsewhere he declares that images and pictures in churches were very useful for the instruction of the ignorant who could not read. Sergius after this repaired the images of the apostles. Now I have to make a little, a, a little explanation to what I've just read to you. I know that I don't know where I read it I think it was in um, The Two Babylons from Alexander Hislop, which of course links the Roman Catholic Church to its Babylonian roots, um, that there it stands that s many early church fathers said that, you know, we cannot proselytize, mean evangelize the people, bring people to Jesus Christ with with books, uh, whether the Bible, which of course was not openly uh, accessible, but we cannot do that with writings and teaching because people are illiterate. People at that time, the normal people of the land, were illiterate. There were no schools like today, and people could not read, could not read, and could not write. And by that, they could very, uh, in a very hard way, only be taught about Jesus Christ. So these church fathers said, we actually, we need pictures. And you know that we have a saying in our world today that says, a picture says more than a thousand words, right? A picture says more than a thousand words. So it is very often easy to learn when you see pictures instead of when you read. How do we teach our children in the very first years? We show them books, books which have a little few written words in them that we read to them, but they are accompanied by pictures. You know, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is that, this is that. That's how we teach children what things are, so they can learn. Pictures are easy to learn. But 
there is a difference between looking at pictures and adoring pictures and idols. But when you make pictures of something heavenly, which you even can't because you cannot even imagine something in heaven, then you are making idols of it. And that is the point talked about here. And these church fathers said they needed these idols, statues and all that stuff to bring people closer to Christ. And I say that's a whole load of baloney. Just tell them about Christ. Just read the Bible with them. Everybody can be taught to read and write, but people were supposed to be kept dumb. Like today. They don't want us to be smart. They want us to be that smart that we can operate the stuff they put in front of us. But they don't want us to understand life. They don't want us to understand the Bible and the Word of God, because if we understood, nobody would listen to them anymore. And the Antichrist would completely lose his power tomorrow if everybody understood uh, all, its, uh, all of a sudden. <laughs> it's that easy. So that's why people like me make videos to bring to you, to, the uh, to, to you the understanding of what you really have to, to, to learn. And sometimes a picture says more than a thousand words. I agree with that. That's absolutely true. But I do not agree that the people are taught the gospel easier by showing them pictures, and uh, uh, pictures of saints and idols and all that stuff. And that's what happened at that time. So I'm going to repeat this sentence on the top of page 58 and elsewhere he declares that images and pictures in churches were very use useful for the instruction of the ignorant who could not read. Sergius after this repaired the images of the apostles. John the Seventh adorned a great many churches with the pictures and images of the saints. And at length in the reign of Philippicus Constantine the Pope, in a synod held at Rome, decreed that images should be fixed up in the churches and have great adoration paid them. Now, do you see how easy it is to fall into the apostasy when you give the devil the little finger, how he takes the whole arm? You say, we need these images and this figurines to teach the ignorant because they can't read and then in the next synod the Antichrist tells you that these images should be fixed up in the churches and have great adoration paid them. From one comes the other. When you allow pictures and when you allow images and when you allow statues and idols being made then it is only a very small next step to command that these need adoration as the emperor did in this case and there you have even greater apostasy and when you want to read about apostasy just read Ezekiel chapter 8 where the angel is, is taking Ezekiel through, uh, through the different parts of, 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 the, of the house of God in that time, uh, through the tabernacle, and uh, tells, uh, shows him this, and you know, the 25 men turned, to the, turned their back to the temple, uh, and their face to the uprising sun, and woman weeping for Tammuz, and all that stuff. Uh, isn't that all in Ezekiel 8? I think so. Look it up for yourself. You know, and here we have the same apostasy creeping into that church. But of course, that church was apostate from the beginning. So Constantine, in a synod in a synod in Rome, decreed that images should be fixed up in the churches and have great adoration paid to them. He also condemned and excommunicated the emperor himself for heresy. 
because he erased the pictures of the fathers which had been painted on the walls of the church of St. Sophia at Constantinople and commanded that his, that his images should not be received into the church, that his name should not be used in any public or private writings, nor his effigies stamped upon any kind of money whatsoever. The superstition of bringing images into churches was warmly opposed, means almost not, and gave occasion to many disturbances and even murders. The emperor, Leo Isaurus, greatly disapproved this practice and published an edict by which he commanded all the subjects of the Roman Empire to deface all the pictures and to take away all the statues of the martyrs and angels out of the churches, in order to prevent idolatry threatening to punish those who did not as public enemies. Pope Gregory II, uh, we only already learned about Gregory I, who, who put in Boniface VIII as Pontifex Maximus, universal bishop, now, Pope Gregory II opposed this edict and admonished all Catholics, or Orthodox, in no manner to obey it. This occasioned such a tumult at Ravenna in Italy between the Parthians of the Emperor and the Pope as ended in the murder of Paul, Exarch of Italy and his son, which enraged the Emperor in a high degree so that he ordered all persons to bring to him all their images of wood, um, wood, baths, I don't know what that is, uh, bath, uh, brass, yeah, this is, uh, the R is missing, yeah, um, so that he ordered all persons to bring to him all their images of wood, brass and marble, which he publicly burnt, punishing with death all such as were found to conceal them. He also convened a synod at Constantinople where, after a careful and full examination, it was unanimously agreed that the intercession of the saints was a mere fable, and the worship of images and relics was downright idolatry and contrary to the word of God. Hallelujah! He also convened a synod at Constantinople where, after a careful and full examination, it was unanimously agreed that the intercession of the saints was a mere fable, that's still Roman Catholic canon law teaching today, and the worship of images and relics was downright idolatry and contrary to the word of God. I hope that you, my dear listener, understand this. We are speaking about the emperor who is in Constantinople, convened a synod in Constantinople in the east, where a few years later in 1054 you had the big schism, the big breaking away of the so-called orthodox church of the east from the so-called orthodox church of the west. The Roman Catholicism of the east fell away from the west because of they had differences, unovercomable differences, like, for example, we can read here that in Constantinople was a synod convened and the worship of images and relics was downright idolatry called and it was identified as contrary to the word of God. Yes, because the word of God says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That is what God says in chapter 20 of the Bible in the book of Exodus. And because the church of the eastern nations, the church of the eastern of Constantinople, at that time at least, adhered to that part of the word of God, they had already a schism with the Roman Catholics of the west of Rome. So when you ask yourself what is the difference between the east and the west, orthodox belief or Catholic belief, because they are all the same, in the beginning it was 
that they said that the intercession of the saints was a mere fable and the worship of images and relics was downright idolatry. Well, they said that then, they don't say that now anymore, because when you watch the Eastern Orthodox Church today, meaning the Russian, the Greek Orthodox, you watch the so-called fathers of that church today, yeah, the patriarchs of that church, they carry the same images than they do in the West. But here at this time, we are speaking about this time in history, there was even a synod called in Constantinople, where after careful and full examination, meaning probably they studied the word of God, they unanimously agreed that the intercession of saints was a mere fable and the worship of images and relics was downright idolatry and contrary to the word of God. Now, this already puts this church probably in great danger. Because I don't think that the Pope and Rome were very much like what they unanimously agree on on this synod in Constantinople. But as I have not prepared reading this, let's just read on, because I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and as Germanus, Patriarch of Constantinople, favored images, the Emperor banished him and substituted Anastasius, who was of his own sentiments in his room. Gregory III, meaning Pope, Antichrist Gregory III, in the beginning of his pontificate, assembled his clergy, and by their unanimous consent, deposed him on this account from the empire, and put him under excommunication, and was the first who withdrew the Italians from their obedience the emperors of Constantinople, calling in the assistance of Charles, King of France. After this, he placed the images of Christ and his apostles in a more sumptuous manner than they were before upon the altar of St. Peter, and at his own expense made a golden image of the Virgin Mary, holding Christ in her arms for the church of St. Mary at Presape. If any one of my Roman Catholic brothers, if I can call you that, ever watches this video, think about the two ways that Jesus Christ is being portrayed within the Roman Catholic Church. He is whether a helpless baby in the arms of his mother, or he is hanging on the cross. That is the picture that you get of Jesus Christ when you go to the Roman Catholic Church. He is whether a helpless baby in the arms of the quote-unquote ever-virgin Holy Mary, as they call her, or he is hanging on the cross, helpless. In both pictures that are shown to Roman Catholics, Jesus Christ is helpless. He is helpless on the cross and he is helpless in the arms of his mother. That's how Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, is portrayed in the Roman Catholic Church. Think about that. Constantine Capronimus Leo's son and successor in the empire inherited his father's zeal against the worship of images and called a synod at Constantinople to determine the controversy. The fathers being met together to the number of 330 after considering the doctrine of scripture and the opinions of the fathers decreed quote, that every image of whatsoever materials made and formed by the artist should be cast out out of the Christian Church as a strange and abominable thing, adding an anathema upon all who should make images or pictures or representations of God or of Christ or of the Virgin Mary or of any of the saints, condemning it as a vain and diabolical invention. 
deposing all bishops and subjecting the monks and laity who should set up any of them in public or private to all the penalties of the imperial constitutions. Now, this was a very powerful quote that I just read here. And I have to repeat that because when I take my time to repeat Exodus chapter 20 verses 4 through 6 in this video, where God tells us not to make any graven images, I also want to repeat here when the Eastern Catholic Church is correct in her teaching. You have to understand one thing. I am not a Catholic basher. I am not an Orthodox Church basher. I am not a basher of Roman Catholics or Protestants alike. I love all the people, but I hate their wrong doctrine. I hate their apostasy that they show when they fall away from the Bible. It's like Jesus said, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, Jesus said. The deeds of the Nicolaitans, not the Nicolaitans themselves, but the deeds of them. And I also have to admit, when in this book I read, that the Orthodox, even though Catholic, Eastern Church at Constantinople at this time made something right. This is something they made absolutely right. And let's, let me read it again. The fathers being met together to the number of 330, after considering the doctrine of Scripture, meaning considering Exodus chapter 20, and the opinions of the fathers decreed quote, that every image of whatsoever materials made and formed by the artist should be cast out of the Christian church as a strange and abominable thing, adding an anathema upon all who should make images or pictures or representations of God or of Christ or of the Virgin Mary or of any of the saints, condemning it as a vain and diabolical invention, deposing all bishops and subjecting the monks and laity who should set up any of them in public and private, uh, in public or private, to all the penalties of the imperial constitutions. Bravo. This meeting, this synod, where they called. 330 so-called fathers together and they studied the doctrine of scripture and the opinions of the quote-unquote fathers what they decreed what I just read here is biblical and I applaud it the problem is that it probably did not bear that much fruit at least we don't see that fruit today in 2017 they also deposed Constantine, Patriarch of Constantinople, for opposing this decree. So they said, okay, you, Emperor, you are not with us on this decree, then we depose of you. Then you are not anymore our leader. And the Emperor first banished him and afterwards put him to death. And commanded that this council should be esteemed and received as the seventh ecumenical or universal one. Is that a coincidence that at the 7th Ecumenical or Universal Council the Fathers actually agreed on Biblical doctrine? You know, 7 being the perfect number of God? I don't know. Paul I, Pope of Rome, sent his legate to Constantinople to admonish the emperor to restore the sacred images and statues which he had destroyed. 
and then Paul I threatened him with excommunication upon his refusal. But Copronymus, uh, Copronymus flight, uh, flighted the, the message and treated the legates with great contempt and used the image worshippers with a great deal of severity. Now, Constantine, Bishop of Rome, the successor of Paul, seems also to have been an enemy to images and was there tumultuously deposed, and Stephen III, emperor, uh, pope that is, substituted in his room, who was a warm and furious defender of them. He immediately assembled a council in the Lateran Church, where the Holy Fathers abrogated all Constantine's decrees, deposed all that had been ordained by him bishops, and void all his baptisms and chrisms. And as some historians relate, after he having beat him and used him with great indignity, made a fire in the church and burned him therein. After this, they annulled all the decrees of the Synod of Constantinople, ordered the restoration of statues and images, and anathematized that execrable and pernicious Synod, giving this excellent reason for the use of images, quote, that it was lawful for emperors and those who had deserved well of the commonwealth to have their images erected, but not lawful to set up those of God, the condition of the immortal God would be worse than that of men. After this, the Pope published the Acts of the Council and pronounced an anathema against all those who should oppose it. So we just started to see a little light within the Orthodox or Catholic Church with the Seventh Ecumenical Council of Constantinople, where the worship of images and idols was condemned by 330 fathers, after considering the doctrine of Scripture, and immediately afterwards we see the West, Rome, putting it all out, means that little flame that arose out of Constantinople at that time was back put into darkness. That's how Rome works. That's how the Antichrist works. That's how he has always worked. And that's how he will always work in the future. We have not read so much about persecution today, but I can assure you, when you're reading this book with a bloodthirsty mind, you will get what you are looking for a little bit later on. I can assure you what we are reading here and learning here about church history is so much worth. I at least very much enjoyed my reading, which I even didn't prepare. I was reading this for the very first time together with you right now. I did not prepare one word. Just didn't have the time. This afternoon I did the reading I did here before. And now this evening I did this one. And I am very much enjoying myself. Reading this book, commenting on it. And I hope I will receive here and there some feedback. So I hope you enjoyed and first of all I hope that you learned something and that you pick up that book for yourself and other books and read them for yourself. And first and for all study the Bible, the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible, the only preserved true word of God in the English language today, 2017. Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you. Until next time. Bye bye.